week's um, show. And this is a Saturday morning edition. So you're, you're catching me uh, bright and early along with my guest, uh, Katie Ritter. And Katie is uh, from Ohio and she went to uh, Northern Kentucky University. That's where she got her degree and her master's. And she started out, you, I think, started out in pre-K. Uh, also with kind of a, uh, actually, that's where you found your passion for teaching, I think, was working with pre-K. And you kind of bounced around a few ideas, social studies, and found, wound your way into educational technology. And that's where you've been. You've been to a couple schools as kind of that um, tech integration specialist. Your last one uh, is Middletown City School district and you've just recently told me that you have a new job with forward edge and i'll ask you a little bit about that but um katie thanks for being here and if you could um walk us through kind of your journey because it's always i think fascinating for other teachers to see how you how you made your way in in technology integration and then yeah, tell us about um, your new job sure um, so I actually started pre-K um, as a pre-K student. So, um, the, you know, first day I walked in and I remember my first year of preschool and I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, so three years old, I had, uh, you know, determined that I wanted to be a teacher. And, and that's kind of the path that I led and all the decisions that I made up until graduation and applying to Northern Kentucky University. Um, which is, for those people who aren't familiar with it, it's very, very close to the Cincinnati area, like a couple of miles from downtown Cincinnati. Um, and so I applied. I entered their education college and their education program um, and decided that at that time that I wanted to teach um, secondary social studies. So then um, senior year came and I realized that um, you know, maybe deciding what I want to do with my life as a three-year-old wasn't the best decision and my heart wasn't really in social studies, so I had a little bit of a panic. Um, and then I worked in higher education for a little bit. I worked in um, continuing adult education and then I also worked in the president's office, um, which I'm really glad that, you know, that kind of happened that way because um, I very much appreciated working in the president's office and just getting that higher level view of how education works. Um, and so I think that's helped me a lot for the roles that I had after that. Um, and while I was working in the president's office there, I decided, um, you know, did a lot of soul searching, a lot of investigating master's programs um, because they helped pay for it. So that's kind of what boosted me into starting the degree program. So that was a good kick in the butt for me. Um, but so I started looking into it and, um, you know, really doing a lot of soul searching and I realized that, you know, in my undergrad, my favorite classes were um, those technology integration classes and how do you incorporate technology into the classroom when you're teaching. Um, so that kind of led me into looking into degree programs, found the degree that I wanted. They actually offered it at the university that I was working at, um, which was NKU. And so then I started my master's in education and instructional computer technology. And after I started the degree program, um, a position became available where I where I did my student teaching in my undergrad at McNicholas High School, which is a private high school in Cincinnati. Um, so I accepted the role as Director of Educational Technology and um, I was responsible for overseeing the student help desk and leading a class for the students there who took a class um, on how to troubleshoot. They were a one-to-one -one school. So um, we we pulled in a lot of students to help us do, you know, fixing the hardware and all that. So I oversaw that. And I was also responsible for um, professional development with teachers and actually teaching them how to use the tablets effectively and the software and different things that we had um, with the students. And I did that for a few years. And then from there, I went to Middletown City Schools, which is in Middletown, Ohio. It's in between Cincinnati and Dayton. And I was a district instructional technology specialist. Um, I also oversaw the website was another piece of my job, the district website, and all the school's websites. Um, but I worked primarily focused on grades 6 through 12. Um, and, you know, I'd be the contact for all of those grade level teachers to help them and then did a lot of, you know, K-12 PD days um, and different things like that. So from there, I accepted a position with Forward Edge, which is a technology solutions company in the Cincinnati area. We work um, all over school, schools all over the Cincinnati area, a little bit in Columbus, um, breaking out into a little bit Indiana, 
um, and the company started as really, um, you know, networking and managed services and um, video surveillance and um, hardware purchasing. And so um, they brought me on the team to kind of help them come full circle. Now they take care of all that back end and the hardware purchasing. And now um, I'm going to kind of come in and help make it full circle to help with teachers with technology integration and um, help districts assess where their teachers are and um, kind of help them come up with a plan to train the teachers and make sure that they are um, effectively using technology with their students. So I'm really, really excited about that new role. Well, it sounds like it's kind of tailor-made for your talents and your experience. So uh, it sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, there will definitely be some challenges, but um, I'm excited about that. So excited for the new challenges. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, you know, we met at uh, the OETC conference, and afterwards, I came across your blog, and I was really just blown away by how well well it was written, how well you kind of captured the essence of the conference. Well, thank you. And your blog is, I think, Talk Tech with Me. Is that yes? Okay. Can you tell us about your blog? Because even when I was talking to the keynote speaker, Vicki Davis, she talked about, and even I think RM Burn, Richard Byrne, talked about how blogging is really an essential piece for teachers because it really kind of it develops a lot of tech skills within just blogging, but it also really gets you to focus um, your writing and your thinking about ed tech. So can you talk about your blog and tell about um, maybe how what platform you use for it, how you created, and, and just blogging in general? What are your thoughts? Sure, sure. Um, so I started blogging, um, I think I started it while I was working at McNick is when I actually finally started it. Um, you know, and I think we can all remember back to our um, education programs when we were in um, college. And um, uh oh, did I lose you? No, I'm here. I was oh, trying okay. to share your blog while we were, Sorry. were doing that. Sorry, so I'm gonna just um, my screen looked okay. black, so I thought I lost you. I was trying um, to do a screen share to show your blog. I thought I had it all ready to go. So God, you keep yeah. talking, and I'm going to try and find your blog. So okay. Um, <laughs> So, you know, when you remember back to sitting in your undergrad classes or your master, you know, what, whatever your education background is for education, um, you know, we do so much reflection. And I can remember being 19 and 20 years old, like, okay, I'm sick of writing about this. I'm sick of reflecting um, on it all. But now actually being in the field and being in the profession, I found that it is really, um, the blog is kind of my biggest way to, you know, not only reflect on what I've done, like different PDs that I led, what went well, what should I improve on, um, but I can't tell you how much I refer back to my own blog um, about, for instance, like for the OETC conference, um, I've gone to ISTE the past couple of years and I've written blogs about my experiences there. And I usually include all of the links that presenters shared that I want to go back and refer to later, um, summaries of their sessions, um, I remember for Adam Bellow's keynote in San Antonio at ISTE a couple years ago, I wrote um, a blog specifically on that keynote because I was so blown away by him um, and, you know, pulled out some of my favorite quotes that I knew that I wanted to bring up in future PDs or when I'm talking to teachers. And it has just become a really great place for, um, you know, even if no one else reads it, you know, I hope that people, you know, some other people might get something out of it. and resources that they can use and some ideas because you know it's what we're all about here in education sharing but if, even if no one else is reading it it's just it's a great place for me to kind of collect all my thoughts um, on things that I want to do so that I can go back and reflect and then resources too I've gone back so many times when I'm planning a PD like okay I know I saw that um, you know at that conference or I know I I've written about it at one point and what was it I can't remember that link or what exactly was it that they shared so it has served as, um, you know, almost like my public storage place for things that go on in a way. Um, and I just, I think it's so helpful. And I know that especially now with, you know, all the testing and um, especially in Ohio with, you know, when educators start out during the rest of the program and, you know, that's very demanding and all the evaluations. And I know that teachers now just feel so overwhelmed. Um, but I just, I really think if it's not a blog, I think you've got to have somewhere where you can store those things that you come across and that good stuff that you know that you're going to want to use again 
um, and even potentially that you don't know that you're going to want to use again in the future. I've I ran across that where I'm like, thank God I wrote that down in my blog because I, you know, I would have never found this resource again had I not included it in that blog post or something. But I just, I really do think it's um, so important that we are reflecting on what we're doing and, um, you know, we're not just teaching or doing the same lesson for 20 years, but we're teaching 20, you know, different lessons each year for the 20 years or, you know, however that expression goes that we're not just pulling out the binder and doing the same thing every single day that we've, we've got to change um, with the market, with how the times are changing and we've got to keep evolving ourselves. So I just, I think it's important for teachers um, and all educators, principals, you know, people are, like in my position as instructional technology coaches, um, we've got to reflect and, and we've got to have some place, whether if you don't have the time for a full blown out blog, um, it doesn't have to be fancy, but if you don't feel like you have that commitment, you've got to have something where you can keep that stuff together for yourself. Can you, um, you've already talked to me about, I guess, really your, your projects moving forward, and that's really going to be your new job and, and your role. So I'm sure that's going to take a lot of your time. But can you talk about, um, you know, and, and again, this is really just looking at your blog. And again, for those of you who are watching this, I really encourage you to look at your blog because you really do put together some nice, you know, tips, um, nice new trends, nice new tools to use. And again, what I loved about your conference blog is you really captured the essence of the blog, including who the speakers were, the links that you found. So it's it's almost like, you know, you were, your takeaways, your, um, you know, turn king you know, your experience at the conference, which I think is so valuable for us as teachers. We can't go to every conference, but through blogging and through social media, we really can, um, you know, share and share powerful stuff. So um, I, I definitely encourage people to watch your blog. And so talking about your blog, I noticed that you put um, things like, you know, Google tools and new tips and tricks. Is there a trend that you're following that you're really excited about things that you think, you know, again, maybe what Google's doing in the for classroom and that sort of thing. Um, any kind of trends that you're really keen on and following and looking forward to? Um, I'm into? really big on, you know, this is it's very, very general, but um, I am very big on trying to get teachers connected in whatever way that is, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Google Plus, um, you know, just trying to get teachers to see the value in using some of these social media tools or online tools, um, you know, things like even now just watching a Google Hangout, um, a recorded session or a live session, um, just as, you know, almost like a webinar in a sense where they can get these resources. There's just so many, you know, every day you feel like there's something new coming out and um, the value that I have gotten by getting myself connected, um, not just through the blog, but actively through social media has been invaluable to me and I, I um, people joke but I I always tell people I'm like you know I swear I wouldn't be where I am in my career if it wasn't for Twitter because I wouldn't have made the connections I wouldn't have found out about you know things going on in other area you know at other schools in my city in the state and across um, you know the entire country and even you know places like in Australia and in other countries even um, so my big thing is just always trying to get teachers connected and how will it, how can I make it, what, what tools are coming out that will make it easier for them to get connected so they don't feel like, you know, they're spending hours and hours trying to get something up and to maintain it. Um, but, you know, what's going to make it easier for them? How can they get connected? What are the latest ways that educators are connecting? And so that's really a big thing um, that I try to follow and just trying to constantly, you know, get teach, you know, how, how do you make the teacher want to invest in themselves and want to put the time in outside of their normal school day, outside of the grading and things that they do outside of just the school hours and things like that. Um, so that's really the biggest things um, that I'm following. And then just always, you know, I've always got tweet deck open with 50 different columns of hashtags and topics just to kind of try to stay on top of it and always try to see what's really going on out there. I think, and then, you know, kind of specifically for the classroom, um, one of the biggest things that I've tried and kind of been trying to educate myself on and stay on top of is really augmented reality and a lot of gaming and education. Um, and by no means am I an expert in either of those areas, but those are kind of two areas that 
I really think are going to get big. And I think that, you know, educational software companies are seeing the value in how um, those types of programs can really educate students and they get them actively engaged and involved and excited about whatever it is that they're doing in the classroom. So, um, you know, I've kind of, I've been seeing a big shift in a lot of the software companies really making it, um, you know, more of like a, a gaming environment, more specifically even than the augmented reality, but very much the, the game environments um, uh, for themselves. You know, in the classroom, I think one of the big things that I've been trying to um, educate myself more about and kind of stay on topic or on top of um, augmented reality because I think that the technology, you know, I think that's a little bit down the road, um, but I just, I think that the technology is going to be there to really make um, some awesome educational experiences for kids. Um, and then also even more so, and I think it's, it's already here and I think it's going to be huge, is really the idea of gaming and education. And I think that software companies have seen the value in that and seen how engaged kids get when they're, um, you know, in doing more of a gaming environment instead of just your traditional drill and kill kind of stuff. Um, but actually making them like stop and think in the moment and have to make choices and points and reward systems um, and badges and all those ideas kind of go into this gaming, you know, gaming idea. And I, I just think that software companies have seen the value, seen how engaged kids get, and they've taken advantage of it. And they're starting to develop programs um, that kind of embrace a lot of those characteristics. Um, and I think it's, I think it's going to be huge. I don't think it's anywhere near what it's going to be yet. You know, that's a great point. And I, I really want to maybe tie two threads of that of our conversation together. And one of them where you were talking about how you try and share with other teachers about Twitter and really be an advocate for how Twitter has helped you. And I totally agree. I think Twitter has helped my career. I think really a lot of the social networks that I belong to, even from Google Plus to, um, you know, I'm a little maybe on the, the far fringe with like Second Life. I found that helped me even with my professional development. Yeah. Um, and so, but let's also bring in, you know, the gaming aspect, because I think that's, a, again, a future trend that's out there. When you talk to teachers, and maybe this is, maybe this is just a small sample size from where I'm coming from, a lot of times in workshops, if I ask teachers if they use Twitter, I get very few hands that, that get raised. Um, and, you know, I wonder, and then, you know, when you talk about gaming, I think you really start to see teachers eyes glaze over and again I, I don't I think a lot of that because so much reform has gone on that has been um, has I think taken kind of put teachers in maybe a more comfort comfort zone box where they're not willing to try something extra mm -hmm. are you finding that and is there a frustration in that despite the fact that you see like such power um definitely a little frustrated yes I try my hardest not to let it show <laughs> when I'm in those situations because all that's gonna do is alienate them um, but yeah I mean I um, speaking to the social media stuff first um, I have done a handful of PDs on Twitter um, you know and what is reward you know because it's not gonna work for everybody the same thing when I'm you know showing teachers a tool that they could use in their classroom I tell them this may not work for you. You know, it may not work for everyone and it's not gonna work for everyone in the same way. So kind of the same thing with social media, um, that, you know, Twitter may be too overwhelming for one teacher, but maybe Google Plus works really well. Or maybe it's LinkedIn in a group where, you know, they're sharing different articles and trends going on. Um, you know, and maybe social media is just too over somebody's head, but then they've gotta be in the faculty lounge having these conversations there or they've got to be, you know, in some sort of group gathering with multiple districts where they can be having those conversations face to face. So I think a lot of it is, um, you know, and you don't always have the opportunity to get to know people, but a lot of it is, you know, get to know that person that you're talking with or that group that you're talking with and suggest some ways that they can make those connections that would fit what they might be comfortable with and might actually take hold of. Um, and one way that I tried to do that with Twitter um, specifically, and I'm actually presenting at ISTE this year um, in Philadelphia about it, 
um, a poster session um, about, I did a district-wide Twitter t contest. So kind of pulling in that gaming piece to it, where every day, um, you know, I tweeted a challenge that they had to complete on Twitter, and it was, every day was something really simple. Um, like, you know, the first couple of days was just create an account, follow someone, um, retweet someone, follow five people that you don't know, not from your school or the district, but who also teach the same subject. Um, so just really, and, you know, and then they had to start actually sharing a resource. You know, one of the challenges was like tweet a link um, that has to do with the subject that you teach or something. So kind of helping them see how Twitter can become a resource where we started, um, you know, and they came to the PD session to learn about Twitter and we set up their account there and, um, and then actually going through the challenges so they could see the value and how they could use it in education. Um, and then there were prizes at the end and every day that they completed one of the tasks, I was keeping track of it with our hashtag. Um, they had to use the uh, Twitter challenge hashtag in each of their tweets so that I could keep track of it. Um, you know, and then they, they each got a point each day. Um, and just every time that I've either done the PD or from that district-wide challenge, it's very, it's always rewarding because you always have a handful full of people who say, I really didn't think I was going to like this. You know, I thought it was just people talking about the coffee that they had in the morning um, or what they had for breakfast, but I really saw the value and I really see how I can utilize this now and how much value I can get out of this. So that's always rewarding to hear that at the end, like, okay, it was worth something. It was worth those frustrations. Um, but I just, you know, I think it's all about baby steps with some of this stuff and trying to tailor it to to what would work for them. Um, and with the gaming aspect of it, with kind of that side of it, um, I remember I was skeptic at first. At first, so I always try to keep that in mind. Um, and I remember when Jane McGonigal was the keynote, the opening keynote at IST in San Antonio, and she talked all about gaming. And I remember going into that keynote thinking. Um, okay, really, like, come on, and, uh, you know, I was a little skeptical, like, we've got our first keynote, is all about gaming and education, and that was really my wake-up call, to never judge a book by its cover, so to speak, but to always be open to something new, because um, she just blew me away with her ideas and the, the concepts that, um, even just suggesting, even if, you, you know, if a teacher doesn't have a simulation or a game, so to speak, that they could play with the kids, pulling in a lot of those gaming concepts to help get the kids involved. Um, so sometimes just kind of trying to point out those those key concepts that she talks about to get the kids more engaged in, in whatever they're doing. And, um, you know, just reminding myself that you were that person too once and you were skeptical of, you know, that. Um, and I just, I always think it's about, you know, what you do and how you make it and how you use it in the classroom. and. And a lot of that's going to be up to the teacher. So what, you know, Sally next to me may see is, you know, no good and not valuable. Well, Jim down the hall might be using it in such a fabulous way and his students are loving it and they're getting a lot out of it. So I think a lot of it's just how how the teacher uses it. That's a good point. And um, yeah, I guess I think a lot of teachers will embrace, uh, you know, I, being a former teacher, an elementary, you know, teacher, and I, I think teachers really embrace new ideas. I think maybe, maybe we've just gotten to a culture where, you know, it's not always innovation is always uh, welcomed. Um, and again, I, I think maybe because the reform was just so there was so much reform so quickly that maybe teachers went into a comfort level. But I, I really I agree with you. I think um, just seeing the value and seeing small steps. I think uh, I think really there's there's so much great stuff in, in education for the future. Okay. So, and you make a good point um, about you know not always a lot of room for innovation. I just I think that's such a shame. And you know when you mention all of that reform, you know teachers most teachers teach because they love it and they love what they do and they love helping kids and being around kids and um, you know inspiring people. But at the end of the day, it's our livelihood. Right. I mean, that's how we pay the bills. It's how we take home the check. And when you feel so threatened by, um, you know, tests are invading and taking over and, you, you know, you, your kids have to get certain scores and the different, you know, all the other reforms plus their evaluations. And I think there a lot of it is that they're starting to feel threatened and they're starting to feel worried um, for their jobs and just so much stress and pressure that the thought of trying something new and it 
and it failing and it not working and they just lost a day of teaching and all the time that they spent planning it and, and trying to work it out, I think it's terrifying to them. Um, and I understand that, why that's scary to them. Um, but I, you know, I would encourage all administrators to embrace that innovative spirit in your schools and that culture and encourage them. Um, you know, every day we can't get out there and try something new and it fail. I get that. But, you know, every now and then, high risk, high reward. Sometimes it's not going to work, and sometimes you're going to hit a home run out of the ballpark. Um, and it's going to be awesome, and the kids are going to love it, and you're going to love it, and it's going to be really valuable for the kids. So I would encourage administrators to encourage that for their teachers and model it themselves, you know, by trying to do something different with their staff meetings or something. Um, but I just, I, I wish that that, you know, fear wasn't there um, for teachers because I think that's a bummer and I think if they didn't have all that stress on them they'd be a lot more willing to try something new and be okay if you know today it doesn't work out but next week it's awesome. Agreed. Okay um, kind of last question and then we'll get into the speed geek questions. Yeah. Tell me about who inspires you um, educationally. Um, well, the first person, you know, when I was looking over these questions, the first person that I thought of, um, and I'm pulling him out specifically, but there's so many other people that I've seen, um, you know, on Twitter or Google Plus or even LinkedIn who have been willing to help out. Um, but the first person is Tom Murray, and um, he works he uh, somewhere around D.C., but he does a lot of stuff where he's going to the White House. Um, and he's working with President Obama, and he works for All for Ed, and they're all about, you know, educational policy and trying to influence it um, and, you know, make it so that it benefits uh, people out in, you know, the rest of the country and that they're getting access to Internet, um, trying to get superintendents on board to take the pledge, the Future Ready Pledge, and, um, you know, make sure that their schools and their districts and the families that attend the schools have equitable access, that everyone has access to the internet. And I think that um, I think that that's a huge task. I think that it is a task that um, it sh we shouldn't still be struggling with today, and especially with so much push for technology and 21st century education. Um, and so I just, I think he's really admirable for the work that he does. But then he also, um, a few months ago, he was leading a Twitter chat and, um, I remember asking him a question and he reached out to me and he said that, you know, that's going to be a lot more than 140 characters. Um, you know, I was, kind of, I was asking him for some advice and um, he messaged me and we actually, we set up a Google Hangout and he took time out of his day. Um, he actually had to reschedule at first because he had to go, he had to do something the president was asking him to do. Um, so that's how busy this guy is that he's, you know, taking requests from President Obama and he took the time out of his day to sit down and we probably met for somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour um, over a Google Hangout and he was just talking some things through with me and giving me some advice um, and aside from just a lot of his ideas that I think are great, I think he's innovative, I think he's um, you know very flexible when he was working in districts to help his teachers get where they need to be but I just, there's so many people like that who are willing to take the time out of their busy lives to help you. In education, I think that's because at our hearts, we're all educators and we're givers, and we like to help people. And um, I just I pulled out him specifically, but I think it's important to note how many other people have been so willing to, um, you know, share something that they've used with me, you know, so I didn't have to start from scratch. And I just I think that's an awesome community of educators out there. So I would encourage people to. Um, you know, try to be a little bit more of that kind of person because you never know how much you're going to help someone just by, you know, sharing a link or writing a blog post about it or, or you know, whatever that may be. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to point out, um, I don't know if you can pull up that picture that I put in the link. Um, it's that Hour of Code link. But it is Marissa Mayer, and she is the CEO of Yahoo. And... Um, I don't know much about her, really, honestly, other than this picture that you're going to pull up. But this was one of the posters for the Hour of Code. And um, she said, I always did something I was a little not ready to do. I think that's how you grow. And so um, I just, I love that quote. And I feel like that's always been me. 
um, you know, I've always pushed myself where I'm, you know, feeling in a little bit unfamiliar territory. Yeah, that's it. A um, little unfamiliar territory, but I think she's exactly right. Um, and I think that this is something that all teachers and administrators and students should think and, and take away. And, you know, if you stay inside of your comfort zone and, and what you know and, um, you know, just everything that you're comfortable with, you're never going to grow. Um, and we're never going to push ourselves and find new things and find new ways to, to do things in the classroom and help students. So I just, I love this quote. Um, and I just, I hope that everybody can take a little bit of that away and always push themselves and challenge themselves. And it reminds me to do that too. when um, you know, I find myself getting cozy in my comfort zone. Yeah, that is a good quote. Um, all right. Well, I, we've, we've hit our half hour and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I'm going to, we're going to go to the speed geek questions. Okay. And so again, these are just short answer off the cuff kind of things. And here are our first question. I'm again, I'm using the Decide Now app on my phone. And the first one is, oh, this is a good one. Google, Bing, or Yahoo for a search? Or maybe I always use Google. I'm all about Google. <laughs> I, know. I love Google too, but you know, Bing is not a bad little search engine. You know, Yahoo's been pretty solid too. But uh, if there's one, if there's one alternative that I'll go to outside of Google, Bing's getting there. It really is. Yeah, I think I'm a little closed-minded on that one. I'll admit <laughs> that. But uh, yeah, I'm all about Google. I'm in Chrome. It's convenient. So it is. It's a great search engine. Yeah. All right. Um, well, this one, favorite educational blog? Hmm. A tough one, I'm sure. Um, probably Edutopia. I love Edutopia. I think that yeah. they are, you know, they are the model for educational blogging resource. So I love them. Yeah, and they put together a lot of different things. They're not just a, a kind of a one focus yes. um, blogs. They really do. They, you're right, they do. And I think Vicki Davis writes for Edutopia, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. All right, and the last question is, ooh, this one's a really tough one. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> awesome. I with you, too. All right, well, Katie, thank you so much for taking your time. And I think you, you represented your, your point earlier is that, um, and that's what I really did this show for, because I wanted to bring – the fact that there's great educators out there doing great things and people don't always know about them and yet they're so willing to share and be a part of a, a great conversation. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll keep in touch and I'll see you at Istio. I'll be in Philadelphia. So absolutely make sure awesome. I see your poster session. Great. Thank you so much for having right. me. I appreciate good it. Good luck with that new job. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. You too.